Back to Griffin, Cheney and Company. Cheney, Griffin and Van Acker in 2011 were sceptical of Graziano's claims. Their paper in that year suggested that the high-frequency cortical stimulation used by Graziano does not produce functional natural actions, but rather it eliminates and replaces natural activity. They call this neural hijacking. In 2014, Griffin and Cheney's group repeated Graziano's 2002 and 2004 work with an investigation of EMG patterns associated with high-frequency, long-duration intracortical stimulation of the motor cortex. While they did confirm a final common endpoint for the forearm when stimulating a specific region of the motor cortex, they did not find functional movement patterns. And they proposed an alternate view from Graziano suggesting that the cortex perhaps knows joint angles. Instead of angles, they suggested an equilibrium point based on muscle-length-tension relationships. At each joint, a specific level of activation of agonist and antagonist muscles will correspond to a specific joint angle, and therefore stimulation will always result in the same endpoint. So to begin to understand the endpoint equilibrium hypothesis, we will look at a simple example using springs as muscles. Remember, muscles are not simple linear springs, but it helps to get started on equilibrium points. Here we see two springs as muscles for an elbow. In this state, the length and tension of each spring determines the posture of the elbow. Our elbow is in its equilibrium posture defined by, these, by the length and tension of the springs. If we perturb the elbow from its equilibrium state and then let go, the elbow will automatically return to its equilibrium state. As you can imagine, this is unchanged whatever perturbation you try. Problem is, this does not transfer to real muscles. Why? Because we have only one equilibrium point for the elbow in this model. To make this more real, we need the ability to vary the length-tension relationship for the agonist and antagonist muscles, therefore allowing for a range of possible equilibrium. This is exactly what P.B.C. Matthews in 1959 was able to show for the cat's soleus muscle. The paper titled, A Study of Certain Factors Influencing the Stretch Reflex of the Decerebrate Cat, is a classic in motor control. Importantly, the finding that the size of the stretch reflex may be greatly reduced by selectively paralyzing the gamma nerve fibers by the application of procaine to the muscle nerve. This may not sound like much but at first hearing, but it is a really big deal. That the stretch reflex can be modified is a big deal. In my history as a PT, the stretch reflex was simply the jump you get when you tap on the knee and therefore really nothing to do with motor control. But it is more significant than that, much more significant. In fact, the stretch reflex is seen as the basis for motor control. Matthew's experiment used the right soleus muscle of 17 cats to explore the stretch reflex. The muscle was fixed at one end and a retractable device at the other. The muscle was then lengthened at a rate of 1.7 millimeters per second. We see on this slide a red spring for a muscle being lengthened. A red line illustrates an EMG recording and the blue line shows the tension developed by the lengthening. Hence a slow extension of a muscle causes contraction and tension in that muscle. This is the stretch reflex. There is a reflex response to lengthening of a muscle. We tend to think of a reflex as a fixed stimulus response event. However, the stretch reflex is very modifiable, as we shall see. First, a plot of muscle length on the horizontal axis versus tension on the vertical axis. And it is not a straight line. That, it is, not a, that is, it is not a linear spring. 
notice that the muscle begins to contract at about 2 to 3 millimeters and it stretches out to a length of 12 millimeters and develops a tension of about 1.4 kilograms. Next, Matthews added procaine to the nerve of the muscle. The small gamma nerve fibers become paralyzed sooner than the larger alpha fibers. Procaine is used by your dentist to numb your mouth. The effect of complete paralysis of gamma fibers reveals a much later onset of muscle recruitment, that is at 10 to 11 millimeters. There is no contraction before 10 millimeters of muscle lengthening. The threshold for muscle recruitment has moved to the right of the graph, and tension developed is much less than for no paralysis. Now, procaine takes a while for full effect of paralysis on the nerve, as we all know, and as time goes by, at six minutes, the stretch reflex has a threshold of four millimeters, and at nine minutes, the threshold for recruitment is at 7.8 millimeters. As a summary, then, gradual paralysis of gamma nerve affects both the length at which a muscle will be recruited and the tensional force it can develop at that length. Functionally, an interpretation of these results is that muscles can be defined as nonlinear springs with an adjustable length. If we look at each curve, the fact that it is a curve shows that the muscle demonstrates nonlinear behavior. That the length at which the muscle can be activated is variable and controllable demonstrates that the nonlinear, that the nonlinear spring model for muscle behavior has variable length. For me, understanding the equilibrium point hypothesis has been a gradual process. But at this point, seeing Matthew's 1959 results, I begin to get the idea how significant these results really are. Anatole Feldman is a researcher who became most excited about these results and their significance. For motor control of action, the brain only needs to provide input for the length at which the muscle will become active that is, the length at which an action potential causes contraction of the muscle, or that is, to set the threshold for the stretch reflex. This variable controllable muscle behavior as a nonlinear spring with variable length via the gamma input is a very powerful natural physiology. Even at first glance, it is obvious that this gamma nerve and length tension relationship for muscle behavior is a powerful, flexible mechanism for motor control. This is the basis for the equilibrium point hypothesis proposed by Feldman in 1966. What if central cortical and brainstem systems could also regulate the stretch reflex thresholds? Well, one person became very excited by Matthew's work. His name is Anatole Feldman. He repeated and confirmed Matthew's work but went one step further to test for central effects on the stretch reflex. Feldman and Orlovsky in 1972 found that many descending systems, vestibulospinal, reticulospinal, corticospinal and rubrospinal systems could modify muscle activation thresholds. Matthew's work was one of the inspirations for Feldman's equilibrium point hypothesis for motor control. One final conclusion about what this means is that to Feldman, anyway, by centrally setting and resetting the stretch reflex threshold, that is the length at which a muscle is recruited, is a simple global mechanism for motor control. Under this hypothesis, according to Feldman, there is no need for the motor cortex to directly know or recruit muscles, or know joint angles, or in fact any biomechanical variables or motor commands. It can control movement by changing the length at which the muscle is recruited when stretched. And remember, the cat soleus is recruited into action at 2 to 10 millimeters of lengthening, with concurrent tension forces. Action is produced by changes in threshold positions of body segments. Feldman has worked with this equilibrium point hypothesis since 1966. His theory is not intuitive, but based on scientific experiment, like Matthew's 1959 findings, and 
Feldman and Olofsky 1972 report on higher centres affecting muscle spindle output and shifting the muscle length at which it becomes active. The difficulty is what you make of this. Higher centres can alter the length at which muscles become active and this determines an equilibrium point for a limb. So what? At first take on this I have one simple example. A person is walking along, limb action during stride is driven by an equilibrium point for that limb, the heel strike occurs at a given coactivation of agonist and antagonist leg muscles at the hip, knee and ankle. What if the foot lands on an unstable rock and the ankle rolls? Certain leg muscles are suddenly stretched. The stretch reflex is automatically engaged throughout the leg and spine, bringing the limb back toward the equilibrium point for that limb. If the reaction is fast enough, the person merely stumbles a little and keeps on walking. That's your motor control. Now the same goes for action. Again, our person is walking, and as the heel strikes and weight shifts forward towards the metatarsal heads, the calf lengthens. And when its threshold is reached, it is recruited to drive push-off. That's your motor control. That is a regulation of the stretch reflex. I will leave you to ponder and read up on Feldman's equilibrium point hypothesis, which Feldman now calls the theory of referent control of action and perception. That is, he has promoted his hypothesis to a theory. Remember, a theory in science for practical purposes is accepted as a fact, quite different to the public perception of the word theory.